Well, good morning, New Vine. How are we all? Hey, turn to the person next to you and say, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. We hope you've had a wonderful morning. We are really glad you're here. Hey, if you are visiting with us, a special welcome to you. Thanks for joining us on such an important day of the year, the day that we celebrate the birth of Jesus. And that is worth celebrating. So we're going to sing some songs together. Some of them are carols if you will probably be quite familiar with, even if you've not spent much time in church. But I urge you to just have a look at the lyrics that remind us of what this season is all about. So I'm going to invite you to stand. And we're going to sing together. And away in a manger, no crib for a bed. The little Jesus laid down his sweet head. The stars in the sky look down where he lay. And the little Lord Jesus asleep on the hay. The cattle are lowing, the baby. No crying he makes And I love thee, Lord Jesus Look down from the sky And stay by my side Until right, morning sing, it's Christmas, and it's is the only night. day we can do it, all right? Just sing loud. It's Christmas The angels are singing And I know the reason Savior is born. It is Christmas. The bells are ringing. I feel like shouting. Joy to the world. Be near me, Lord Jesus. I ask thee to stay. Close by me forever and love me, I pray. Bless all the dear children in thy tender care. Fit us for heaven to be with thee there. This Christmas, the angels are singing. And I know the reason the Savior is born. This Christmas. Bells are ringing, and I feel like shouting joy to the world. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills, and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. Have you had a fun morning? Yeah, what did you do this morning? Did you just sleep in? Any parents get a sleep in this morning? Don't imagine so. Hey, well, Joy to the World, we're going to sing another song, Joy to the World, funnily enough. A reminder that today is a joyful day. Yes? Sorry, I, got, I paused for a minute. Also, side note. It's completely a big tangent. Today is Jesus' birthday. Today is also Troy Crookshank's birthday. Hey? So joy to the world that Troy's here. More so joy to the world that Jesus is here. No offence, Troy. 
But I sing this with joy to the world. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare Him room. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and nature sing. Joy to the world indeed. Good morning, everybody. Happy Christmas. Well, would you please take a seat? It's so good to see you all here this morning. My name is DJ. Uh, I'm the lead pastor here if we've not met. Special thanks to our band this morning for kicking us off in such a wonderful spirit. Why don't you give them a round of applause on Christmas Day? But a round of applause to you as well for, for coming here to be with us, but to come together and celebrate uh, the heart and meaning of Christmas together. And good morning, Sheridan. Good morning, DJ. Well, if we haven't met, my name's Sheridan. I'm the Associate Pastor for Children and Families here at Newvine. And we're so excited. Yeah, thank you, AJ. Um, we're so excited that you are here. Um, quick housekeeping note, though. Um, we're not running our children's programs this morning, obviously, because it's Christmas. But if you do have restless toddlers, we have our creche room open and available to families. The only catch is you do have to supervise your own kids because our volunteers are off today. Um, alternatively, we have some colouring in available in the foyer for our other kids who might want to do something like that. But... Yeah, and uh, a special welcome this morning if you are watching online, uh, so from far away that you are tuned in, we're really glad that you can. Uh, a special welcome also to visitors. Uh, if you're visiting with Newvine for the very first time, then it's wonderful that you're here. And although we won't probably all of us be hanging around long afterwards, because we've all got places to go and people to see, uh, no doubt, uh, we hope to meet you and get to know you better at another time. And also, one special shout out this morning, and that is that we've got Paul and Vanessa Whiting and family all here. Morning, guys. 
Hi, Abby. Hi, Jemima. Really nice to have you all with us this morning. For those of you who don't know, Paul, Paul and Andrew, where's AJ this morning? Over here. Paul and Andrew are responsible for all of this. They planted this place. What is it, 28 years ago now? 29, 40, 70 something years ago now. Uh, and Paul uh, continues to be our New Vine Network pastor and also to pastor our uh, church plant down at Jules, which we call New Vine Beaches. Well, welcome to you all, though. And kids, a special welcome to you. Hey, we're going to need your help today. Would you be so kind as to come on down the front for us this morning? Because you might be able to help us out in a very special way today. Isn't that right, Sheridan? Yes, yes. And our older kids as well, kind of up to maybe high school. If you want to come down the front as well, you are very welcome. All right. And as they're coming down... Kids and grown-ups, who has already opened a present today? Oh, that's a lot of hands. Oh, okay, that is a lot of hands. <laughs> grown-ups, who's opened a present today? Yep, <laughs> Phil Plant has. What did you get, Phil? An aeroplane. An aeroplane. Air fryer. Air fryer. <laughs> An air fryer. <laughs> Slightly more packageable. Yep, yep. More, more practical. Good work, Anna. Although next year, I've raised the bar now, haven't I? (laughs) Good one. All right, what about you guys? Does anyone open the present? All right, so you've got to tell everyone your name and what did you get for Christmas, just one thing. Um, I got a Guinness World Records book. Ooh, a Guinness World Records book. Okay, anyone else? All right, what have we got here? I got a Bumblebee Transformer. Awesome. Bumblebee Transformer. Very, now very cool. And one more. Um, I got a Magic Mixie. Ooh, a Magic Mixie. Very cool. Well, do you, kids, do you want to see something I got for Christmas this year? I got a potato. A potato? <laughs> yep. Uh, at a Secret Santa thing a couple of weeks ago. Isn't that right, Paul? And to go with it... A potato gun. How good is that? It kind of explains the potato a bit, doesn't it, really? Um, I'm wondering if I could re-gift this possibly this morning to someone. <laughs> Anybody like my potato? <laughs> and potato gun? I've got takers for potato, but not the potato gun. How about that? Yeah, Phil could use it with his air fryer. Here you go, Phil. Incoming potato. Very good. Who'd like the potato gun? All right, there we go. Good work. All right. Well... It wasn't my child, so that's okay. (laughs) This is how it's going to work this morning. So, I am going to read the story from the Bible about the birth of Jesus. And we've been reading, if you're just joining us, we've been reading through Luke's account in the New Testament. Luke is one of the writers who captured the accounts of Jesus' life on earth. And I'm going to read the story, and then we need your help to help bring the story to life in 2023 here in Maryland. Is that okay? Okay. Do you think you can help us with that? You guys ready to help? All right. Well, for those who'd like to follow along, the passage today is, as I say, from the book of Luke in the Bible, and it's going to be up on the screen. There we are. And uh, I'll read it. And the story starts today like this. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree. Hang on, DJ. Who is Caesar Augustus? Ah, okay. Caesar Augustus. Anybody heard of Caesar Augustus? Anybody out there? He made a a famous salad. That's right. Inventor of? What was that? He made it in August. He made a Caesar salad in August. This is getting better. I like this version. Uh, the revised New Vine version of uh, the Bible. Well, actually, Caesar Augustus was the emperor in Rome at the time that this story happened. And he had been actually declared as the first ever Roman Empire, R- Roman emperor. Okay, so emperor, so we're thinking like a king? Like a king, yeah, yeah. Okay. Except he was kind of like the, the OG of kings. Right. He was like the most powerful guy uh, more powerful than a king, probably the most powerful man in the world at the time. And he had, um, well, let's say, uh, 
seen off all his rivals and enemies at the stage. So he had kind of all powerful rule in Rome. Right. So powerful, a powerful king. Mm-hmm. But he's got a bit of a strange name, Caesar Augustus. Yes, and he wasn't named after the salad. But Caesar was a family name. So he had received the family name. Like, my name is Cons, and your surname is? Correct. <laughs> uh, I'm hoping. Uh, no, that's... So, like, my surname is Cons. His family name was Caesar because he was the adopted son of Julius Caesar. Who's heard of Julius Caesar? Yeah, there we go. Okay, Shakespeare and all's getting down. Great. Fantastic. So, that's where Caesar came from, but the name Augustus. Can anyone guess where the name Augustus came from? Any grown-ups out there? Augustus? Not August. Wasn't born in August. It actually comes from a Latin name meaning majesty or venerable. It was a title of honour given to him by the Roman government. Okay, so we need a powerful, king-like, venerable Caesar Augustus to help us this morning. Yeah, someone very venerable. Okay, all right, I think I've got just the thing. I think we might need a um, a grown-up to be our Caesar Augustus. I think that's probably right. Hmm. Who can I pick Aged. And wise. Oh, I see some, um, some hands pointing. Some hands, okay. Some dobbing happening over here. Who would be our most august? Would you care to be our Caesar? Majestic. Oh, the, do- the dobber is getting dobbed in. Here we go. Scotty Logan. We will now call you the venerable Scott Logan. Caesar Logan. Very, very good. Well, okay, so on with the story. Oh, no, hang on. Scotty, you need to keep start counting oh, right. very yes. soon. Okay, so we'll give you a counting implement in just a moment. But on with the story. Let's take a look, kids, up on the screen. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken in the whole Roman world. What's a census, though? Well, in the olden days, a census was the way that kings and emperors would count all of the people in their realm so that they could, you know, raise taxes and raise armies and probably to give them sort of bragging rights about, you know, my empire's bigger than your empire, all that sort of thing. Okay. Yep. I've got just a thing. Caesar, if you can please um, count everyone who's here today, it'd be great. And while you're at it, can you just issue this decree for us? In a very venerable voice, please. Uh, Timothy Reed is to pay Scott Logan's mortgage for the... No. <laughs> um, everybody must return to their own town to register and to be counted. Signed by Caesar Augustus. And the Reed boys should help me count. Oh, very good. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Very venerable of you, Caesar. All right, keep counting over there. Now, uh, kids, uh, who was born here in Newcastle? Who was born in Newcastle? Maybe at the John Hunter Kids Hospital or somewhere like that? Yep, okay. Who was born somewhere else? Yeah, okay. What about grown-ups? Who was born in Newcastle? Wow, a lot of Nova Cashers. Who wasn't born in Newcastle? All right. That's a lot of imports. Okay, I'm an import too, so that's okay. Well, you could well relate to this, those of you who weren't born in Newcastle, because back in the day for the census, everyone had to return home to their own family. Have you counted? Yes, Scotty? Very, oh, okay. <laughs> Very good. Everyone had to return to their family home towns just like Louise and I and family are going to do after the service, we've got to drive to Tamworth to see Louise's family because they still live in her hometown. Okay, so that's, that's kind of like what's happening in our story. In the story, that's and right. And Caesar, you're going okay with the counting. Do you need some help? I think Caesar might need um, a helper with I think his that's counting. a good idea. All right, let's find out what happens next in, this, in the story. This was the first census that took... This is going to take us a while, isn't it? We're up to, anyway, let's keep going. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to their hometown to register. Okay, so Quirinius could Quirinius. be our helper. Yep. Who do you think Quirinius was? Who he does it say up the there? He governor was the... of Syria. So I think Caesar's already elected his Quirinius, so I'm going to go give them their kit. We don't have another laurel crown, but a prince's crown is kind of the same. Yep, that'll work for an ancient Roman governor, I'm sure. Very good. All right, well, while Caesar and his uh, sidekick are counting, 
Why is it that you think that Luke gives us all these boring details and that we've lingered on them so long at the beginning? <laughs> Why doesn't he just get straight to the fun part, right? The baby Jesus part. Why is he giving us all this detail? Anybody like to guess? Sorry, I hear something. John? To keep the dates right. Okay, so Luke is writing as an historian, so he's wanting to make sure that we know that this story isn't myth, that it's grounded in a particular place, a particular people in history. But there's also another reason that he gives us this kind of detail, which I'll come back to at the end. Okay, so we have our Caesar, issues a decree, and he gets counting. Mm -hmm. What happens next? Yep. So, let's get to the exciting part. Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house of David. I think we might need some more help here, Sherry. Yes, I think at this point we need a Joseph. So can we have a Joseph? Would you like to be Joseph today? Come on up. All right. <laughs> so we know Joseph was a carpenter. And wore a really great Had bow head thing. A great fashion sense. All right, so we've got your carpenter belt. It's actually a bit trickier to buckle than I remember. And um, some tools. Here you go, Joseph. We'll pop those tools in there for you. Alrighty. Wonderful. And Joseph's going to wait over there in Nazareth. Yes, we've got our Nazareth here. Um, but, but DJ, who is David? What oh, was special about his family? David, okay. So David was uh, a king of Israel back in its glory days. Uh, when Israel was hoping for another king in the family of David, from the family of David, to rise up and, uh, let's say again, just see off all his rivals and enemies of Israel at the time. So, to see off the Roman rulers like Caesar and uh, Quirinius and so on. Uh, because unfortunately, Caesar and Quirinius, uh, all this census taking, fundraising, taxing people, raising army, not very popular with the electorate. Uh, so Israel wanted to throw off the Roman rule uh, through someone from the house of David. But how do we know that, Sheridan, that um, people were waiting for someone from David's family? Well, a long, long time before any of these things happened, the ancient prophet Micah, Micah <laughs> wrote about it. And we've got his message recorded in the Old Testament. So he says, But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, Though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. So grown-ups, we've got all of this kind of political stuff going on underneath the story, or they're hinted at the story. And uh, I wonder what Luke might be hinting at here when he identifies the coming baby with the line of David through the town of Bethlehem. What do you think he's kind of wink, wink, nudge, nudge, kind of hinting at there. Well, let's see a bit later on. So, back to the story. Joseph went up to the town of, from the town of Nazareth to the town of Bethlehem. We've got our Bethlehem over here. And who did he go with? Who can see up on the screen? Who did he go with? Mary! Mary! Okay, so now we need a Mary. Okay, Mary, come on up. And what does the story say about Mary? Well, it says that Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph and was expecting a child. Okay, so Mary is pregnant. We're just going to have that miraculous pregnancy. I mean, this is pretty quick. It usually takes nine months. <laughs> I reckon that was about nine seconds, so that is pretty miraculous, isn't it? Okay, so Mary, can you put your... Yep, you got it? Yeah, got it. Can you just hold that underneath your dress so it, so it stays? You pinch it there. Okay. Yeah, hang on. You've got to hold it. Just... Yeah, that would, that oh. would be great. Very good. Okay. Actually, maybe we'll, get, maybe we'll get them to come some of the journey over towards Bethlehem. It's just, just a slightly longer pregnancy. 
So while they're in Nazareth... I'm not going to give any commentary on that. That's a landmine territory okay. there. So we've got our Joseph and our Mary. We've got Nazareth. Yes. Bethlehem. Okay, okay nice work. So now we have to travel from Nazareth to Bethlehem. But, kids, how did they get there? How do you think they got there? Was it Mitsubishi Outlander? Donkey. Toyota? Donkey. Donkey. Hybrid Donkey. RAV4? No, that'd take way too long to even get delivered, wouldn't it? How did they get there? Donkey. Donkey! Okay, well, actually, this story doesn't say anything about donkeys, but maybe they did. It's a possibility. We don't have any donkeys today. No, we don't have any donkeys. We're a bit but short on donkeys. We do have scooters. So, um, Joseph and Mary, if you could please scoot over to Bethlehem for us, very carefully across the stage. Yeah, don't you. lose the baby on the yeah, way. Yep. Yeah. So if you would like to get out of the way. scoot across. Yes. Looks like it's not that easy, well, um, scooting whilst pregnant. Assist. Good work, Joseph. Keep going, Joseph. Oh, go. you've got it running to a lead. That's it. Don't mind the lead. Don't Watch mind the guitars. The oh, good work. Great job. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Okay, well, okay. good job. So uh, what happens next? Let's read the next bit. While they were there, are they there? Yep, they're there. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to a son. Okay, so Mary, if we can take your um, pregnant belly out. Thank you. And now we need a baby. So if there's anyone here with a baby three months or younger that you'd like to stand up and let us have a look at your We baby. do have a few newborns in the congregation. Stand up if you have a, a baby a few months old or less. Babies. We, we actually need a really sturdy Good baby Good work. for our story this morning. Oh! Baby's born. Do we have a sturdy baby? Oh, we've got one. Oh, we do. Oh, oh thanks, hang on Diana. a minute. This is headline news. Oh, thanks, Noel. Noel and Diane, Beautiful congratulations. Baby. We didn't know. Okay, so Mary and Joseph, if you'd like to come over here, here's I'm, your baby. I'm thinking this is a bit more of a, a, a Zachariah and Elizabeth moment here. Thank you, and congratulations. Oh, there we are. So we have baby Jesus. On with the story. Well, what happens next, kids? Let's... Look up on the screen. Mary wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger. Okay, so I've got some cloth, and it is particularly biodegradable and um, really handy for messy nappy cleanups. So, Mary, if you would mind swaddling your baby for us, wrap them up. Beautiful. And um, what's I think it this might other word? A bit, I think the nappies might leak a bit, those ones. Oh, uh, yes, yeah. Be very generous with your wrapping. All right. <laughs> well, anyway, we while, that's, while, they're, while they're swaddling, kids, what did, what did Mary place the baby Jesus in? Good job, yes. Mary. Um, a manger. No, it says manger. Manger. Isn't that manger like hanger or clanger? Banger. Or man what is it? A manger. All right. Well, what's a manger? What's a manger? A type of bed made out of hay. Very, very good. Well, it so happens that I've brought my rabbit food container here, full of hay. Uh, grew up on a farm. Don't live on one now, so I was a bit short on, you know, feed troughs. So poor old Penny the rabbit's going hungry this morning while we, um, while we did this. Actually, we might go over here. Guys, we, can we bring Jesus over here? We can put Jesus in the... Uh, we will take the lid off the manger. Food trough there. Might very be very good. soft with the lid on. All right. Beautiful. And you keep watch of your newborn baby swaddled in cloth. Okay, so DJ, yes. I'm a bit confused. Why would you put a newborn baby in a manger? Wouldn't you go a, a bed or a cot? Well, that's a great question. Why did they put... The baby Jesus in a manger. Adeline. Because there was no... That's right. There was no guest room available. Now, a sidebar for the grown-ups. Just to clear something up. 
When you think of this story and you think of Jesus traveling to Bethlehem and getting turned away, where were they turned away from in you know, the classic story of Christmas? Their home? That's right, they left their home to travel to Bethlehem. But where were they turned away from? Oh, everyone knows this is... I'm not putting my hand up now. You're setting me up for a fall. From the... Just shout it out. From the inn. Okay. Well, for a very long time... We translated this word in the original Greek of the story as in, it's a, it's a translation that comes basically from medieval times, when you can picture medieval inns with you know, tankards and all of that, can't you? But actually, we know now that that's probably not the best translation of that term. And I'm going to mess with your Christmas story for a minute. Is that okay? All right. So we now know that this word that was translated for a long time as in is actually better translated in this context as guest room. Could all your kids say guest room? Yes. Very good. Like an Airbnb kind of thing, except uh, in, in relatives' houses. So this is kind of a quick drawing of uh, what, a, what an ancient Middle Eastern home might have looked like. And you can see that there's this main living area in the middle, and to your right, you can see the guest room that this word would was used to describe. And to the left is the area that the animals would shelter during bad weather, winter, etc., which it was when this story was unfolding, very likely. So, in what's probably going on is that Joseph and Mary arrive in a place, time and culture where it's the oldest people in the family who receive the most honour. And so they would be the ones who are honoured by giving them the guest room in the first instance. And the younger people, even pregnant young women, uh, wouldn't have been honoured as highly. So when Joseph and Mary arrive, probably at relatives' house, they find that with the census going on, all the rel other relatives have arrived, and there's no room in the guest room because very likely it was, um, it was populated with people like Diane and Noel who are deserving of great honour, isn't that right? So that may be what's happening. So perhaps like other people, we don't know, the story doesn't say, perhaps like other relatives who showed up but who were younger, maybe the kids had got kicked out as well of their beds, they were taking shelter in the stable area of the house where the animals would usually stay. And close proximity there, probably above a small sort of ledge, so the stable would have been set down a few steps, and at about you know, feeding height would have been the feeding trays. And it's very likely that, um, Mary placed the baby in the dry hay in one of those feeding cloths. Now, we don't know all of that for sure, but we think from the latest sort of scholarship that that's uh, a way of understanding that story. But regardless, it still emphasises how humble an arrival into the world that the baby Jesus experienced. Where even in the family situation, he was right down the pecking order when it came importance. So there we are. So you think, DJ, after this part of the story, it's a good time to stop and sing? I think it might be. We might stand up and sing together a very fitting song, Away in a Manger. Just boot swaddling cloths out of manger. the way there too, I think. Would you like to stand with us and we're just going to sing a verse or two of this classic uh, song done traditional style, I guys. But we're under the pump, so we're going to sing at double speed, all right? Ready? Away in a major note. We'll go back to normal. Away. Beautiful, lovely. Also, a timely opportunity to stretch your legs. Uh, there we are. So would you take a seat again? Okay, Sheridan, we are well into the story now. Yes, and Caesar, have you finished counting? I think we've actually lost Caesar. Oh, there he is. Perfect. All right. Well, while you were busy counting, something quite amazing happens in our story. 
And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby. And what were they doing? Kids, who can read it? What were they doing? Keeping their sheep cold. Okay. That's why they have the fleecy jumpers, though, isn't it, with sheep? They were watching over their flocks okay, at so night. Now we need some shepherds. And I think this might help us get some volunteers for shepherds. Can I have maybe two or three shepherds? These are your shepherd crooks. Yes, they're edible, but not till after you have minded your sheep. Okay, so we'll go one, two, three, four. Four shepherds. And those who aren't shepherds, don't worry, you're not going to miss out. So we've got our shepherds. Now, your job is to watch over your sheep. Do you know where where the sheep are? Where are the sheep? (laughs) Whoa, there they are. Okay, great watching there, shepherds. Very good. Okay, so we've got shepherds, we've got sheep. And what happens next? Well, maybe we need a little bit of nighttime kind of vibe. Can we get a bit of nighttime vibe? Georgie? Oh, there we go. Is that nighttime vibe? All right, so they're watching over their shit, flocks at night, and what happens? An angel of the Lord appears, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And how were the shepherds? Hang on. We what don't does have it say? An, We don't have an angel yet oh, we don't to have be an angel. terrified of. Amy, can you be our angel? But I am going to ask that you trade your, yeah, your reindeer headband for something slightly more angelic. There we go. All right, we'll get you to jump up for us. All right, very good. And we'll get you in the middle. What happens, shepherds, when the angel appears? How do you feel? Terrified. Terrified. Can you look really terrified? Ah. That's not bad. Let's try it one more time. Look really terrified. Okay, we'll go with that. I think that might be the best we get. Okay, well, the angel then replies. Can you read this here for us, Where? angel? Right here. Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in town of David, a saviour has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Very nice work, Angel Emmy. Yeah, give yeah. her a clap. Good work. Well, Saviour, Messiah, Lord, those are interesting names, aren't they? We're going to come back to those just a little bit later on. But if that wasn't freaky enough for the shepherds, what happens next? Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, we might stop there, Hang on, actually. hang on. If it's a heavenly host, one angel isn't going to cut it. So if the rest of our kids would like to come up on stage and be angels, please, to build our heavenly host, come grab a... Maybe if you stand over here next to Emmy, Emmy can be the lead angel. We've got our angels on this side. We've got our shepherds on this side. Shepherds, don't forget, you're meant to be afraid. These are pretty scary angels. What lovely angels, right? How about a big round of applause for the angels? Good work. And the shepherds. Okay, so we've got our heavenly host, but I think we we need something extra to really give that that vibe that there would have been that night. Yep. Well, what is it that the angels say? They say, hey, angels, can you turn around? And if you're able to read, can you read the words on the screen? I'll read them with you. Ready? One, two, three. Glory Glory to to God. God Actually, sorry. Why don't we get some more heavenly hosts to help us out? Would you all say this with us on the count of three? One, two, three. Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favour rests. Good job, angels. Good job. Okay. And I think this would be a great spot for us to sing another song. I think so. We can amplify that Gloria even more. What do you reckon? Thanks, Isaac. Hey, we're going to get you to stand with us. We're going to sing a song together. Gloria in excelsis Deo. Gloria 
Thank you, angels. That is wonderful. So. Okay, so if our angels would like to take a seat down the front again. Because the next part of the story says, when the angels had left them, have we still got our shepherds? Where are our shepherds? Give us a wave. If you're a shepherd. Shepherds. Wonderful. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem. Okay, shepherds, are you ready to say this with me? Let's go to Bethlehem. Let's go to Bethlehem. And see this thing that's happened. And see this thing that's happened. Which the Lord has told us about. Which the Lord has told us about. Okay, wonderful. So we'll head on over to Bethlehem then, guys. Let's go. And is there a baby for us to see? Is the baby still in the manger? Oh, very peaceful. Shepherds, I think this is a pretty cute baby, right? Together, which is clear. Oh. Wonderful. Oh, and we've lost your sheep again. What do you think the sheep might say if they saw this cute baby? Maybe, maybe. Well, on that note, you'll be pleased to know we're nearly at the end of the story. (laughs) But they're doing a great job, aren't they? Holding it all together. Okay, so when they had seen him... They spread, this is the shepherds. Are you ready, shepherds? shepherds. We'll come they back spread way. the word concerning what they had been told about the child. Okay, so shepherds, it's time to spread the good news with the adults here. If you can take one of these boxes of delicious good news and hand one out to each of the adults. You can not a whole box. Not the whole box. I'm sorry, guys, you're not getting a box each. <laughs> Just one, one piece of good news, please. Every adult? Every adult. So if you guys, we might need a couple of angels to help I wonder if, us. Yes, I wonder if, the, maybe all the angels can help actually spread all right, so the we'll good go, news. So if you take them, spread out, hand them out. Maybe a couple of grown-up shepherds and angels to help. Some, some senior shepherds. Okay, so while they're handing out the good news to everyone else, what about Joseph and Mary, who have been very patiently waiting Mm. at Bethlehem? Child's now a teenager. (laughs) Not quite. But they have been waiting very patiently over there. And as the shepherds go out to share the good news with everyone that they can find about what they'd heard, All who heard it, the story says, were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. So this is time for mass crowd participation, okay? So all the people were amazed. Can you give us your best amazed cheer? Shout off. Well, about three rows were fantastic. Let's try that again. Let's, let's hear a, an amazed shout. Woo! This is amazing! 
amazing. Yeah, even I was pretty half-hearted there, so you're forgiven. And then as we get towards the end of the story, Mary treasured all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned to their families. Yes, they're I just returning added that now. Bit. But if the shepherds could return already. to their families and the angels too, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Well, there we are. Okay, well, what a great story. If everyone could give our kids a massive round of applause. Some were eager to help, some were bribed into it. And our Joseph and Mary have been fantastic. Um, and kids, if you weren't a shepherd, come see me off the side and you can have a shepherd's crook, aka candy cane, to get you through this last little bit. Okay. Yeah, one more round of applause for Joseph and Mary over here. Big round of applause for Sheridan and all of our kids as well. And just to wrap up, as the kids settle back in, in just a few short minutes, let me, let me tie up some of the, the loose ends that I said we'd come back to later, including going right back to the very beginning. Luke starts this story with a reference, as we saw earlier, to Caesar Augustus, a man of such immense power that he issues one decree, one diktat, and everyone is disrupted. Everyone has to obey the decree. Everyone has to stop their work, earning a living, trying to put food on the table, and in many cases travel to other parts of the country just because of the power of one man issuing a decree. So the story starts there, but it ends, at least this part of the story, ends with shepherds spreading the word of a baby born in the back streets of Bethlehem, a baby laid in a manger because its parents had such low status even in their family that they didn't warrant a guest room. So the question is, why bookend the story in this way? Well, as we saw earlier, for one reason, it was to ground the story in its historical context. But it was much more than that as well. Luke here telling the story is setting up a contrast and he's setting up a confrontation. It's a contrast and a confrontation, not just between two kings, but between two kinds of kingdoms, two ways of being kings, the might of empires versus a new kind of kingdom which would turn the world upside down. How so? Well, Augustus, born into nobility and wealth, had accumulated power through conquest, through vanquishing his enemies and consolidating power until he ruled with an iron fist and a long list of dead guys who had once opposed him. But for Augustus and many autocrats since, even absolute power was not enough because even autocrats like today's tech billionaires fear death and yearn for immortality. In the case of some recent examples, spend literally millions if not billions of dollars trying to find ways to live forever. But some years earlier, as I said back in the story, Augustus uh, had been adopted by Julius Caesar. And even more recently, Augustus had had this adopted father, Julius Caesar, declared to be a god. And this in turn allowed Augustus to adopt the title son of God, son of the divine god Julius. And some parts of the empire, even Augustus, was being worshipped as a god, even as Jesus comes quietly into the world. And what's more, Augustus now referred to himself as the saviour of the world, the bringer of the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome, to all on whom, it was said, his favour rests. By contrast then, Jesus was born into neither nobility nor wealth. Later he shunned power 
And Lord, one day teach not to vanquish our enemies, but to love them in all sorts of profound and costly ways. Demonstrated himself on the cross. The contrast then that we see by starting this story with Caesar and finishing with the shepherds telling of a baby born in humble circumstances in a back, the back streets of a back lot town called Bethlehem, the contrast is between the might of Rome and the meekness of Jesus, the way of empires and the way of the kingdom of God, between those who claim to be divine and grasp at power and the one who, though being in very nature divine, did not consider it something to be grasped, as Paul says, but who made himself nothing, a baby born in a manger. Really, this contrast and this confrontation between empire and the kingdom of God is no contest. Luke makes sure that we see that behind the human hand of Augustus issuing a decree is actually the work of God to fulfill an ancient prophecy that the true king, the true Messiah, the true saviour of the world would be born in the town of David. And yet the humility of Jesus' birth points forward to the way in which Jesus establishes God's kingdom. He will be king not through conquest, violence, and vanquishing human em em enemies, but through vanquishing violence itself, along with all the enemies, the ultimate enemies of humanity, including death itself. In fact, Jesus brought what Augustus sought, but could not achieve. Immortality, eternality. Because to receive it, what Augustus sought, we have to walk the way of Jesus, not the way of Augustus. As we, heard in our, as we head into our festivities today, when all the dust settles, my challenge for us all is to remember that on the first Christmas, God gave us a gift, a true king, a true Lord, a true saviour of the world, and a genuine bringer of peace, the true son of God. Not a pretender, but the real deal. So the challenge for us this Christmas and every Christmas is really this. Which sort of king and which sort of kingdom will you seek to serve? And will I seek to serve? Because there are, there are many today who are awaiting another Augustus, another strong man, human leader, who will vanquish their foes. And there are also many willing Augustuses waiting in the wings, ready to grasp at power, to wield an iron fist, to proclaim themselves a saviour in the world. But that way is the way of empires and autocrats. There is another way. It's the way of the high king of heaven. Come to earth in a baby born in a manger. It's the harder way. It's the humbler way. It's the way of suffering and self-surrender. It's the way of Christmas. It's the way of Jesus. So as we eat, drink and be merry today, remember that beyond all of that, Christmas is an annual call to walk the way of Jesus and be part of his ongoing work in the world to bring peace on earth and to be like the shepherds, spreading the word of what we have seen and heard, reminding the world that it has a true Saviour, a true Lord, a true Messiah, a true King. Well, God bless you. We're going to stand and sing one more time. Have a wonderful Christmas. 
And may you know the love, the peace, the joy, and the way of Jesus this Christmas. Amen. Yeah, thanks, Deej and Sheridan and kids. Great work. I'm going to invite you to stand as we uh, celebrate again together the gift of Jesus. We read through Scripture that uh, this image of God being light. In John, we read, God is light and He exposes darkness. He lights up darkness. So this song is a reminder that uh, in Jesus, life is found. You ready to sing with us? Great. Christmas to you today. Thanks for being with us. Our hope and our prayer is that you have a wonderful day celebrating this time together. But above that, that this morning, that through this day, you grow in your understanding that there's a God who loves you, a God who cares deeply about every aspect of your life, so much so that He came to earth, that He dwelt in humanity so that we would know who He is and what He is like. That's worth celebrating today. So have a fantastic Christmas. A reminder that we have no service on this coming Sunday, New Year's Eve. Service is online. 
So you can show up, but you'll be in the car park by yourself. Otherwise, join us online and we'll see you soon. Have a wonderful day.